The year is 1994, and the so-called notebook computer has replaced the venerable Luggable as the portable of choice, offering enough horsepower to be taken seriously in the business market at a price that no longer makes your comptroller scream bloody murder. And this lovely little 486 machine is Digital Equipment Corporation shot across the bow of this lucrative business laptop market. It was available in both color and monochrome models, with up to 20 megabytes of RAM and either a 120 or a 200 megabyte hard drive to go along with its 33 megahertz 486SX. Of course, DEC was competing with plenty of other options, including the AST Bravo NB, which is the exact same machine, except with a slower processor and a slightly rounded form factor that simply would not do for a company as serious as digital. All of this mobile computing power had a price tag starting at $1,700 US, roughly $3,000 adjusted for inflation to today, the end of 2020. Welcome to DOS Simber. Or should that be DEC Simber? In either case, I'm going to take this opportunity to give this recent acquisition of mine a little bit of TLC and replace its aging and acoustically problematic hard drive with a slightly more modern compact flash solution to increase its storage and hopefully reduce its chance of failure. But I don't want to do a fresh install on this machine, because as it is, it's quite nicely configured, complete with MS-DOS, PCMCIA card services, Windows 3.1, and even a vintage install of Microsoft Word. So instead, I'm going to attempt to clone the existing hard drive partition over to a nice CF card and preserve all those 1990s bytes. First thing to do is get this little machine open. Unlike some earlier clamshell portables, this machine is thankfully a breeze to disassemble. I'll start by removing the long dead battery using the release lever here on the bottom, which you can't see. After that, the two corner screws at the front of the unit get removed. That's one. The two screws at the rear of the unit hold the screen assembly, so I don't want to remove them just yet. In fact, I'm going to make sure they're nice and tight at this point. And then the final front screw is mismatched. It takes a Torx driver. I actually lost this screw when I was checking for battery leakage, which, by the way, is the first thing you should do as soon as you acquire any vintage computer. Take it from this guy. And finally, inside the battery compartment, there are four smaller screws that need to be removed. Laying it right side up, I'll open the lid since the screws for it are still in place. The lid releases with levers on the two sides, and I'll open it to about, I don't know, 150 degrees, and then prop it up on my screw tray. And the final screw to remove is hidden annoyingly beneath the function key legend here on the left side. Now, using a plastic spudger, I'm going to release the plastic clips holding the top case in place. In particular, the one in front of the trackball does take a bit of force to release. Now I can work the top case loose and lift it up, minding the keyboard ribbon cable. And again, I'll use the spudger to release said ribbon cable using the tabs on the sides of the connector. And then gently walk the cable free of the connector. Finally, I can disconnect the trackball cable, and the top case is now free to be set aside. Now to remove this hard drive. It seems to be mounted in a frame that's attached using two screws. The bottom one removes easily, 
but the top one is partly blocked by the status LED board, so I kind of have to bend that board to get to the screw. Now that the drive is free, I can remove the 44-pin IDE ribbon cable by walking it off the pins from both sides to avoid bending them too much. This is always a problem when taking these old connectors off of parallel IDE notebook hard drives. And now I can attach the drive to this USB to IDE adapter and clone the fat partition over to a CF card. Alright, so now I've got the Seagate hard drive attached to my Linux machine with the USB to IDE adapter, but unfortunately, I've hit my first stumbling block. Using the lsblock command, the drive isn't showing up in the device list, only the two SATA drives built into the system are. And when I look at the kernel messages after attaching the adapter, down near the bottom it says SCSI scan inquiry result too short. So it knows there's a storage device attached, but it can't read any data from it, like a partition table. Just as a further test, I'm going to try to read the first disk block using DD. And that fails too, so Linux is definitely unable to access this drive via this USB adapter. And I think I know why. This hard drive, a Seagate ST9140AG, uses an addressing scheme known as Cylinder Head Sector, or CHS. In this system, disk blocks are identified by their physical position along the three axes of cylinders, heads, and sectors. Modern hard drives use the logical block addressing scheme, which abstracts the physical geometry of the drive into a linear numbering of sectors. But this ST9140 probably doesn't support LBA addressing, and almost certainly this USB IDE adapter only knows how to talk LBA. So, with the drive and the controller speaking different languages, Linux can't identify the drive, and I'm going to need to find a system with an IDE controller that supports CHS addressing. Which brings me to this lovely machine right here, a Gateway Pentium 4 Mini Tower. I've dug this machine out from the depths of my closet because it's the newest machine I have with good old-fashioned IDE, and it can also boot from USB, which makes it a great candidate for running something like Clonezilla Live to copy this old hard drive. It's been in the closet for quite some time though, so first I'll need to address this failing graphics card, and this CPU fan has also seen better days, but I think I'm just going to live with that for now since it is still spinning. I love how these old cases open. So I've got this StarTech CF to IDE adapter here for the compact flash card. I'll borrow the power cable from the floppy drive and then connect it to the secondary IDE cable, observing the correct cable orientation. And then I'll take this 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch IDE adapter, connect it in place of the original system drive. And now, with the Seagate drive connected to my cloning system, it's time to copy that, uh, not floppy. Except that the drive refused to spin up. I checked it in the laptop and I haven't killed it, but it doesn't seem to like this adapter. Here I'm just checking that the adapter is providing power, which it is. Luckily, I have another older laptop drive adapter, so I'll try that. Don't you just love that old Gateway logo? And there was much rejoicing, for the drive was detected. I'll go into the BIOS and just make sure, yep, everything looks good. Just for the heck of it, I'm going to actually see if I can boot this computer from this old hard drive. And yes would be the answer, although it runs into all kinds of startup errors, but at least I know it can read the drive contents, so that's very good. But now, for the real work, I'm going to insert my USB flash drive containing a bootable install of Clonezilla Live. This should do all the work of partitioning the CF card, copying the data, and then resizing the partition. That is, assuming that it actually boots. I had a bit of trouble with it, but I eventually got it to boot by going into the other mode, and then selecting Safe Graphics Mode, 
and then just waiting a really long time for the live system to come up. No, seriously, a really long time. But once it finally booted, it did see the Seagate and the CF card. Now, working through the Clonezilla startup, we'll keep the default keyboard layout, and we'll just hit enter here. And start Clonezilla. I'll be working in device-to-device -device mode rather than imaging it. And beginner mode is fine here. And then I'll tell it to clone the whole disk rather than just a specific partition. I'm selecting the 140 megabyte Seagate as my source drive. And my 4 gigabyte SanDisk card as my target drive. I'll let it repair the DOS file system on the Seagate just in case, and prompt me when it's done. So now Clonezilla is going to do its thing. It's very verbose about the steps it's taking. And it wants me to be absolutely sure that I want to overwrite the CF card. Absolutely. And finally, it's copying data. The CF adapter has a cute little activity light in the middle you can see blinking here, as Clonezilla copies all that wonderful DOS goodness over to my modern CF storage. This is, of course, sped up, but it didn't take long in real time either, 128 megs being such a tiny little drive. And it would be nice to have all this extra space on this machine when this is all done. And now it's resizing that tiny DOS partition to take advantage of that extra space. And done. Just like that. Back to the deck, I'm going to install the card in this laptop-sized CF to IDE adapter. No fancy lights here, but it's designed to be a drop-in replacement for a notebook hard drive. It connects to the original 44-pin ribbon cable. And for now, I'm just going to use a plastic baggie to prevent the mounting posts from shorting anything on the logic board. Reconnect the power supply. And the actual power switch is right here on the logic board itself, rather than the keyboard. So I'm just going to poke that with a spudger and cross my fingers. Taking a look at the system setup, something is clearly not right. My 4 gig CF card is only showing us 335 megs. Probably this card is just too large for this system's old IDE BIOS. So much for having all that space. Just to verify that the adapter is working, I'll test that 32 meg card in it and see what the BIOS thinks of that card. And yep, that's more like it. 30 megabytes, ignoring the base 2 rounding error. Now, before I bother repeating this process with a more reasonably sized 512 meg CF card, I'm going to first make sure that the BIOS sees the correct size, which it does, so that's good. 512 meg might actually be the limit for an early BIOS like this, so I'm not going to try and push my luck any further. So, now I'll do the Clonezilla dance one more time.
Fingers crossed. Curse you, storage gods. Out of curiosity, I'm going to pop this card into my modern machine, and yeah, all the files seem to be there. So why doesn't the laptop like it? Time to take a break and consider my options. Over a crunchy bar. A quick rummage through the media shelf produces this colorful disc from which I shall construct a boot floppy. Now, of course, my modern Linux machine doesn't have a floppy controller, but USB floppy drives are a thing, and to format said disc, I'll install the UFI format utility. As for what to write to it, I'll start by looking at the original media images that came on the hard drive. This is a utility that allows you to make original discs to reinstall. These can be written to the disc by a special deck utility. But can I use them to make a boot floppy? Well, the size looks wrong, and examining them with a hex editor confirms there's a special header on the file, but also that the images are for MS-DOS 5, so I'll just get a clean image from WinWorld PC. A quick peek at dmessage shows the floppy drive on SDC. I'll tell UFI format to use the 1440k format. And then I'll write the first disk of MS-DOS 5 out to my colorful diskette. Yes, right, little disk drive. Now, pop in the freshly made boot disk, return the CF card to its adapter. And poke the power button. I'm exiting the installer because all I really want to do is get a prompt and look at the disk. And sure enough, all the files are there. I can reinstall the OS files using our friend the sys command. At least, I thought I could. I wasn't expecting that. I'll reboot and see if maybe it worked anyway. And even though the DOS install is obviously unhappy, the bootloader is fixed, so yay! So I'm guessing the installed system wasn't MS-DOS 5 after all. So I've replaced the original hard drive so I can boot it and see what's actually installed here. Aha! MS-DOS 6.2! Okay. I can reformat this floppy disk as a DOS 6.2 boot disk instead. So now the disk can boot DOS 6.2, and I'll copy the sys utility onto it as well so I can reinstall 6.2 to the CF card. And now with the CF adapter reinstalled, I can boot MS-DOS 6.2 from the floppy. And once again, transferring the operating system back to the CF card using the sys command. One more time with feeling. And we are there. Card services are loading properly, and it even boots to Windows 3.1. Wow, I am so relieved to get this working. We'll exit Windows to do just a couple of checks. Yep, version looks good. But, ugh, 
The FAT16 partition is still the original size. Clonezilla didn't enlarge it properly. This project is now officially frustrating, so I'm hoping my old copy of Partition Magic can fix the file system size. But, of course it can't. Why would it? Why would anything go smoothly on this project? I don't know what in the world Clonezilla did to this partition, but it is just super unhappy. I mean, the partition type just says bad. That's about the state of things. But, what about gparted on Linux, I hear you ask? Maybe a slightly more modern tool can fix this partition. I'll just resize, drag to the maximum size, hit apply, and yeah, that's a big old pile of nope. Looking at the error log. We're working on it. Okay. Who wants to place any bets on the fat resize tool being able to do anything? Yeah, didn't think so. Okay, I see nothing left at this point but the nuclear option. I'm going to back up the files and repartition the CF card. The ever trusty tar will make a very quick backup of this tiny partition. And then I'll write out a proper MS-DOS 6.2 install disk. Disk 1 is all I need here. And then, booting from this disk, I'll exit the setup program and just run fdisk manually. First, I'll delete the existing DOS partition. And then make a new primary one, the full size of the disk. Reboot again. And this time, I'll let the setup program actually start the installation. Hit enter to install. Continue and replace the current DOS version. And yes, format the drive. And I should note that this format is actually not sped up. This is really how fast it formats the CF card. Okay, settings are correct, so go ahead and start the installation. And I'm only going to let it get through disk 1, because that's enough to make the system bootable, which is all I care about. When it asks for disk 2, I'll just hit the power and move the card back over to my Linux system and mount it there. And here we have the basics of an MS-DOS install. Command com, IOSys, and MS-DOS sys. These are the three files that you must have in the right order to boot MS-DOS. IOSYS must come first on the disk, followed by msdos.sys. Command.com can be placed anywhere. And the setup program has done this for me, so I don't want to undo it when I extract the tar file that I made earlier. So I'll tell tar to exclude IOSYS, msdos.sys, and command.com, so it won't move those files in the file allocation table. Oops, forgot to sudo it. That's better. And presto, all the files are back. The unmount hangs for a while because this is when the actual writes take place to the CF card. Linux is flushing its file system cache. This should work now. I'm pretty confident. No boot disk needed this time. Let's see that system boot. And there we are, just like it was on the original hard drive.
DOS Reports version 6.2, and Check Disk shows a 511 megabyte file system. This calls for celebration. So, thank you for hanging with me throughout this rather excruciating process. In the end, I wish I had skipped Clonezilla altogether and just used TAR from the very start. It would have saved me hours of frustration. But in the end, the task is done. Now I can get a good terminal program on here, maybe some games, and really start to enjoy this little machine. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. Check the description below for links to more great DOS Ember videos, and thanks for watching.